Hello everyone, CPAT here with another Yomi2 video, although this one is going to be a little bit different. This is not going to be a commentary over full games like my previous Yomi2 content, but rather this is a semi-prepared video essay that will attempt to explain why I think equipping White Gem on a lot of the characters is very strong. And just for reference of the 9 character roster currently available, take a look at them here. Um, as the base cast excluding Lum, I strongly prefer White Gem on Grave, on Jaina, on Rook, on DeGray, and on Valerie at the time of recording this video. I do like the White on Argagarg as well, but this is a character that frankly I have not spent a lot of time theorycrafting or playing, so I would be unsurprised if there was a potentially better option for him out there. I don't know, I've heard uh, maybe Red is good on him, etc., etc., um, as far as Setsuki is concerned, I'm confident White Gem's not the best pick on Setsuki. I really think she needs a defensive wake-up option. In the, in the cases of Midori and Geiger, I just feel like I have not played enough of them to tell you whether White Gem would be good on them. Um, although my preliminary thoughts on the matter are definitely I am leaning towards green for Midori still, and for this version of Geiger, I'm leaning towards purple, although maybe Geiger is getting changed in the near future, so who knows. So, first off, I guess I'm going to break down White Gem into its four components. I mean, you can see them here, right? Burst, the Gem Special, the Ability, and the Storm. And then, I guess I will explain what the sum of these the comp components essentially means uh, when paired with the character, especially when paired with the characters that I have listed earlier. Uh, so first, let's take a look at uh, White Star Strike, the seemingly unassuming Gem Special here. Um, at 8 speed, it is a very respectable star starter that does outspeed nearly every normal on your turn, outside of, of course, Valerie's and Setsuki's quick low attacks, which are speed 9. It outspeeds every level 1 projectile, so Grey Fireball, Jaina Fireball, Geiger Fireball, Red Gem Fireball, uh, Arc Fireball, and it, out it actually outspeeds most specials as well. Um, 5 damage might seem a little bit on the low side, but for only one combo point, it's definitely nothing to sneeze at. Uh, obviously, the, the card is, I think, way much more than that. Uh, first off, it's not only a starter, right? It's a, it's a linker, which means that it can essentially be placed into the middle of a combo to make more efficient use of your combo points. For example, if we're looking at a character like Jaina, it does fill in the gap between your throw... Actually, we'll go to Jaina here. Uh, it does fill in the gap between your throw, or maybe your crossfire kicks, and your Dragon's Breath uh, really nicely, right? Um, because this is two combo points, and the White Star Strike would be three combo points, and then this lets you uh, fill out those combo points really nicely. Uh, in the case of a character like Rook, it allows you to... Uh, it, it gives you a second way to combo your... Maybe your Heavy High, your Power High attack uh, into a knockdown, right? With a low sweep, with a, with a one combo point linker. In the case of a character like Grave, it allows you to maybe, I don't know, bridge the gap between a card like Rollwind, uh, your 7th speed overhead, uh, into the White Star Strike, into uh, a good ender like Lightning Cloud. I mean, they can link sets of two sets of normal attacks together. Basically, what I'm trying to say uh, is that this is an extremely versatile uh, move, right? White Star Strike. Um... But what does make it different than just sticking in, I mean, in, in the combos that I mentioned above, a lot of them you can just stick in, you know, like an E or a D, right, the normal. Um, but so what makes it different is, of course, the card draw on this, right? So, of course, if White Star Strike hits, uh, you draw a card. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that uh, you're not jeopardizing the size of your hand as if you had used a normal attack to string your combo together. Uh, so personally, I, and this is a concept I will refer to later, although I probably should have given it a better name, I just call it quote-unquote free damage, right? Um, because it costs zero cards, right? Because it, the card replaces itself when you hit with it, um, and it does five damage, right? So it's essentially five damage for free. Um, but there's more. It also means, when you're drawing a card, it also means that you're accelerating your deck faster, uh, which I will, of course, discuss the importance of later. Uh, obviously, I mean, I'm assuming that you guys know a little bit about Yomi 2. Uh, there's, a, there's a theme here of card draw, right? You can even see on, on the bottom it says combos and card draw. 
Um, so this will be a common theme with white gem since obviously most of the components involve card draw from the deck in some way. And on top of that, what, what we didn't even mention yet is the fact that uh, if you use this white star strike as a starter and it hits, you also get an extra bar, right? That's um, it's pretty important, right? There's, I mean, having extra bar is always nice. I think, I think this game, I think you I think you definitely need to build bar on basically every single character uh, to play your character to the fullest ability. So I'm not really gonna explain uh, too much more besides that. But uh, for most of the characters that I listed previously, I think that I think love white gem. Uh, meter meter is absolutely critical. Um, oh, by the way, I'll be using the terms meter and bar exchangeably. I call it bar, but I think the official term is meter. But anyway, I think that bar is critical for these characters because I think these are the characters that are heavily incentivized uh, to play their very strong super over and over again, right? Uh, Grave super being Dragonheart, 15 speed, fastest move in the game, 20 damage for 2 bar. Uh, Jaina at 14 speed, so second fastest um, move in the game, notably a level 3 fireball at uh, 18 damage. And then DeGray's uh, super, which is not as fast as the other two, but is safe on block, right, at 20 damage. I, and I think these three moves, uh, as I'll explain later, are just absolutely critical to the game plans of these characters. Um, there's also some cheeky plays that you can make uh, with the White Star Strike, like for example, you can build bar with the white, excuse me, the white star strike there. You can build bar with the white star strike and immediately, uh, maybe that's your second bar, you can immediately combo and unload into a super that the opponent wasn't expecting. Uh, there are plays like that, but anyway, in conclusion, I just think that this is a really good, and especially versatile special that I think any deck would be happy running. Okay, so next, I guess, let's take a look at the ability card. We have one copy of Inner Focus. 95% uh, of the time, if not more, you're going to be using the second option here, right? Uh, the draw two cards. Um, if, you, if you look at it, right, this is not the most impressive ability out there, right? It, in basically every case, it's worse than Future Sight even, right? Um, and so I wouldn't say by itself, it's not much to, uh, to write home about. Uh, there's one little nifty trick that I do want to point out with this card. Uh, that I think is quite important. Um, sometimes you can use the, the first option here, i.e. fetch a super card from your discard, as a form of kind of action compression. So normally, I'm assuming you guys know the basic rules of Yomi 2, but normally when you power up in this game, you have the option to either go for to build two bar, or you can build one bar and recur a super card from your discard. However, with Inner Focus, uh, you're actually able to build two bar with your power up, and then immediately pick up your 2-bar super with your ability in the same turn. Uh, I think this is actually pretty valuable for closing out games, but it's really it's really, really good, I think, if you manage to, if, you know, you manage to draw your inner focus at the right time. Um, but I say if you draw it early, just go for the two cards. Um, but by itself, you know, it's it's obviously good. It's not great, but it's good, right? It's not, not a bad ability at all. All right, now let's take a look at White Burst. And surprise, surprise, it's the exact same ability. Uh, draw two cards on hit. So I guess I'll go into my general game plan a little bit. Um, so on the characters that I choose to play White Gem with, my general game plan involves using the bursts early to have a healthy hand size in you know the very early stages of the game. I'm talking like first couple turns. There are other bursts in the game, like for example, we'll take like purple here, maybe even blue. Uh, these bursts, they're more incentivized to be held towards the mid or late game, I feel like, uh, where you can get significantly more value out of them. But cards are basically always useful in some, in some capacity, right? So I think this is one of the few bursts that you can actually use early, and I definitely love using white bursts early. Uh, not only to stuff an early attack projectile throw, but also, more importantly, to accelerate your game plan. Uh, as I've alluded to previously, and I'll, I'll explain in a bit for sure. Um, on top of that, I think most of the characters that choose to pair with White Gem won't actually need the reversal speed attack for very long either. Uh, so I think it's totally okay to be using that White Burst early. Okay, so I'm actually going to be holding off on talking about Invigorating Winds, the Gemstorm for now, because I think it adds like a completely 
different dimension to white, which, while it's actually really, really important, it's something I don't want to discuss at this time. I'll, I'll bring it up later. Um, but the major theme, of course, with the three uh, different components that I have discussed, of course, is card draw. Um, we can, of course, now ask ourselves why is card draw so important? And I'm sure that those of you that have played Yomi 2 before, I'm sure you guys know the importance of hand size and having a healthy number of cards in hand. I mean, you run too low on cards in this game, soon you'll be staring down the barrel of an, a potent mix-up where you're heavily disadvantaged, or even worse, you could just be checkmated. Uh, additionally, you can find if, when you find yourself in a position where you have not very many cards in hand, uh, suddenly the game becomes way more difficult in my opinion. Your payoffs are lower, uh, off attack and throw, it's more difficult to build up to a healthy hand size, and so on. Um, but of course, while this dimension of card draw is certainly very important, it's not what my focus will be. Uh, rather, I would like to talk about how good having extra cards really is. So first and foremost, if you are a character with a very good super, I think we gave some examples of characters earlier that have very good supers, you can turn extra cards into supers, right? So, unlike Yomi 1, supers do have two requirements for being played from hand, right? The first requirement is extremely obvious. You need to have the card in your hand, right? You, you, you need to have the card in your hand. Uh, secondly, I'm not even unless you wild swing it, but we're not talking about that. But secondly, uh, you need to have the uh, prerequisite bar needed to play said super, right? So a lot of supers we looked at cost two bar. Um, and you can't play a super unless you have the bar ready, right? right? So what is the most reliable way to fulfill both requirements of playing a super? Uh, it should be incredibly obvious. I think it's the power mechanic, right? Uh, discard a pair to either build two bar or build one bar and recur the super from your discard. Now, compared to every other gem in the game, uh, white does have the most card draw, right? So in theory, purple can come close over the course of an entire game, but purple's card advantage, I want to look at purple here, is in the form of recursion, right? So recursion here and recursion here, uh, meaning that the abil that these abilities are actually best used towards the late game when the discard is more populated. However, we take a look at white's card draw, right? It's from the deck, right? From the deck, from the deck, from the deck. Uh, white's card draw can actually just be activated from the first turn of the game just by successfully bursting against the opponent. Uh, let alone whether you draw any copies of White Star Strike or the Inner Focus in your opening hand. Um, so what does this potential um, mean, potential early card draw mean for a White Gem user? Well, first off, I think it means that you can power up for your supers earlier uh, than a user of any other gem, because, I mean, you have the card draw to sustain those early power-ups, right? Um, and essentially, this activates the pipeline uh, of cards to bar and supers, right? So converting cards, just raw cards, to meter and supers earlier than it does for other gems. I think this is especially important for Grave, Jaina, DeGray, and Rook, in my opinion. So the first three, as we, t we, as we saw earlier, have those uh, spammable two-bar supers, right? The Dragon Heart, the Dragon's Breath, and the Final Arbiter, that I think are absolutely critical to their game plan. And in my opinion, uh, as the game currently stands, I think optimal play of these characters involves using said super multiple times over the course of a single game. Uh, and I think activating that pipe, that uh, card to bar and super pipeline is extremely important to the character. Now for a character like Rook, while Head Crush is an important tool, it's not a tool that I particularly spam nearly as much as I spam the other two bar supers for the other characters that I was talking about. Um, but for Rook, I think it's actually really important to uh, maintain the threat of that uh, checkmate buster, right? Your, uh, let's go look, at checkmate buster here. Your 50 damage three bar move, right? I think it's important to maintain this threat. Um, this will just win games for you, right? Just hitting a 50 damage move will win games for you. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but at the same time, if it whiffs, you don't want to lose the game off it, right? So I think uh, White's actually pretty good at maintaining a threat of the Checkmate Buster, which of course will just win games for you, without being too sad if it whiffs. So there is another aspect uh, to drawing cards from the deck that I've largely neglected. I think I briefly mentioned it once, but I've largely neglected to mention it until now, so we'll, I guess now's a good time to talk about it. 
and it is, of course, the importance of deck acceleration. So essentially what I mean by this is drawing cards then earlier than you would otherwise, right? Through, I mean, just abilities that draw you cards. So this is actually important for two major reasons. Uh, the first, which I'm sure is incredibly obvious, is that you get to you get to your scary cards faster, right? You get to your threats faster. So cards like, I don't know, Jaina's Arc Shots, Rook's Landslide, these cards are pretty important to the character, and obviously they're very, very strong and good cards. And so I think it follows that drawing them a turn or two earlier before you would otherwise seems like a pretty good deal to me, right? But uh, perhaps the second, less obvious reason is that deck acceleration allows you to draw the second copy of a card more quickly, which means that now you have more reliable power-ups as well. So especially in Yomi 2, when you only can exchange once, um, you obviously can't exchange back a pair that you've used to power up previously uh, in one turn, right? You can over the course of two turns, but it's very slow because two turns is really four turns. Um, but with faster deck acceleration, you can use that one exchange to turn a tool you've already used into a power-up way more easily. Or hey, maybe, I mean, just drawing a pair earlier just means you can just power it up right away, right? Um, so this means that uh, the aforementioned pipeline that I was talking about earlier of cards to supers is uh, more reliable with white gem as well, as opposed to, I don't know, a gem like purple that, uh, again, relies on discard recursion. So, in conclusion, I would say uh, the goal of using White Gem's draw tools with these particular characters, with uh, Grave, with Jaina, with Rook, and with DeGray, uh, is to activate this pipeline more quickly, more reliably, and more often, and using these powerful supers repeatedly, especially in the case of Grave, Jaina, and DeGray, uh, using these powerful supers repeatedly to eventually just overpower the opponent and win the game. So that's all well and good, but now let's uh, let's have a chat about the Gemstorm, uh, the Invigorating Winds. Uh, so in my opinion, there are two major use cases for it, uh, although I suppose they're, I mean, somewhat related to each other. I mean, the, the purpose of the, of the White Gemstorm is relatively similar. Uh, the first is more of a tempo play. Let's say you found yourself in a bit of a weaker position. I mean, I'm sure... I've released enough white gem videos where you can you can find myself in a position like this where, let's say my burst didn't land, haven't quite l drawn my other draw tools yet, haven't drawn the white star strike or the inner focus yet. I'm sitting on a smallish hand of seven to eight cards. Well, you pop the gem storm here, and now for two turns you no longer risk yourself running too low on fuel. You can convert some jank combo. I'm sure you see. I'm sure you've seen one where I've converted just the worst combo, the worst looking combo to deal some damage, but more, most importantly, while you do deal that damage, you also ensure that you just don't lose the game on the spot there because you expended too many cards early. Or maybe in a different scenario, you're feeling extra greedy with your burst still in hand, and maybe you want to threaten a burst throw combo mix-up for two turns. Um, but this is more of like a tempo-based play, right? Uh, the second use case for it, I think, is when you, you're more towards the mid-game, and You've assembled very, not necessarily the best, but maybe even the best combos you can. Um, and you're more towards the mid-game and the end game. You have maybe, I don't know, 10 cards in hand. You have combos into high damage options off all three sides of the RPS triangle. Uh, and you want to keep those cards for later use, use as well. Maybe if you're playing a character like a Grave or a Jaina, Rook, or even Valerie, you can pair that Gemstorm. Uh, with your respective ability as well, to really put the opponent under threat for two turns that are risk-free for you in terms of expending resources. I mean, what's the worst that happens, right? Well, the worst thing that happens is, well, you've lost two combats, but as far as resources are concerned, you've recurred two cards, right? So not terrible. I mean, obviously losing combat sucks, but you've recurred two cards, but at best, you've recurred what? five or six cards, right? This allows you to recur the first three cards that you played in combat for two combats. So you've recurred five or six cards. Maybe you've gotten a super back as well, uh, which means that your next power-up will be easier as well, etc., etc. Uh, maybe it means you continue to maintain a huge resource leader of the opponent because the opponent will be spending cards, obviously, during your White Gem Storm. Uh, maybe you've built a life lead if you were able to hit that big combo as well. In truth, I think Invigorating Winds is just an incredibly easy gemstorm to extract at least some value from, 
and I think it just has just absolutely massive potential upside. Uh, so this again ties into the concept of quote unquote free damage, uh, as we saw with the White Star Strike, right? Um, so at the end of the day, Yomi Two's right, and it's a it's a game where you're trying to reduce your opponent's health to zero, right? Um, so you want to assemble a hand that has damaging options, uh, such that you can reach the goal of hitting of hitting your opponent enough times such that their hit points reach zero, right? So the free damage potential that uh, White Gem provides, obviously in the cases of uh, White Star Strike, the five free damage there, um, or more rely more like impressively with the with the gem storm um by not expending resources in either case or white star strike just sort of place itself right can often mean that you can threaten your opponent with lethal earlier with white gem than with other gems just by having more resources than you would otherwise right uh so for this reason alone a character that i mentioned b before that i think really likes white gem but haven't talked about yet uh valerie is a character that i think really likes the white gem um, because of the storm alone, right? I mean, the White Star Strike doesn't really benefit her a whole lot. Um, drawing cards is obviously nice, right? Um, but she, Valerie can make her own combos at will. She doesn't really need a linker. Um, but this is just so good for a character like Valerie, I think. Um, but I think really nearly any character would be really happy with this gemstorm, to be honest. Um, because it simply has the potential to spell an early game over for your opponent with a resource swing that your opponent simply cannot match, right? So I kind of wanted this to be a short video, and it ended up being a little bit longer than I expected, but I hope that it helped illustrate why I think that White Gem, especially paired with certain characters, is just the best pick. Uh, really, I do think that any character would like card draw and would like recursion, so I think it would be unsurprising if in the future other characters found this gem to be useful for themselves as well, right? I mean, there are more characters being released in Yomi 2. Uh, we just have the 9 so far, but there are, what, 11 more at least in the pipeline? But, I mean, in truth, White's card draw simply just cannot be matched by any of the other gems. So I think it's always going to be at least a semi-useful pick, if not the outright best pick for a particular character for the reasons that I was explaining earlier. Um, and then that I'll just talk about the card draw, right? That the gemstorm is more than the icing on the cake um, with its resource sustain and just the the sheer amount of potential free damage that it can output. But anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video essay, I think they're called. I know it's different from a lot of the other content that I put out, but I figured it was time to make a video on why I thought White Gem was a strong pick, uh, especially after the results that I've had with it, right? I mean... You, I, I, I try to try to keep things a little bit diverse, but obviously you have not been doing the best job with it, right? A uh, lot of white gem videos on the channel. Um, I know I didn't really compare it to the other gem choices out there. Maybe I'll do that in a later video, uh, for sure. If you guys, if that's something that you guys are interested in, um, but feel free to comment if you have any points to add or objections or anything else like that. Uh, if you want, I'd always obviously appreciate a like and a subscribe as well. But that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. And don't worry, we'll be back, we'll be back to live match commentary soon. Goodbye and take care, guys.